Okay, so um slide share. Okay, let's slide. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about reading strategies. Um, first thing we've already kind of covered is just to make the point that we do talk about reading for a degree. So um, University Challenge is a classic example of that, isn't it? When people do the introductions, they're introduced um, by name and then they say what they're reading for. And the reason we say you're reading for a degree is because, you know, a large part of your time is spent reading. Um, we've got our own Harry Regan here from St. John's. They got through to the quarterfinals this year. So uh, we've generally had quite a good track record uh, in University Challenge, but that's, that's a bit of an aside. Um, so um, I think the people that are on screen at the moment, we've already done those introductions to say who we are and what we're studying. Um, but if you wouldn't mind, because people have joined at different times, we just run through that again. So I'll start, I'll start with myself, maybe. Um, so my name's Anne Allen, and um, I'm the Deputy Principal at St. John's, and I'm an archaeologist originally. Um, so I, I did uh, undergrad archaeology and a PhD in Durham many years ago. Um, but now um, I'm also studying. Um, so in my spare time, I'm um, doing a course at Glasgow University, that's delivered online, uh, which is about teaching English for academic purposes. So some of what I'll share with you today is stuff that I've been learning about um, on my course. And I suppose what struck me um, as to how um, um, study at university has changed from when I did my PhD to now um, is, is really about that online environment, um, getting digital reading lists, being able to just click um, on, on the um, item on the reading list and not walk to the library or browse the shelves and see what the volume is next to the one um, that you're going to read. Um, so I think in some ways life has been made easier by the digital world, but in other ways we lose something um, of those sort of search skills um, that you might have and that experience you might have by physically uh, going to the library. Um, so I suppose that's that's a point I would like to raise. Um, Jennifer, you um, you said you're doing a PhD. Can you say a little bit more about that and about the reading challenges you've identified? Yep. So um, I'm doing a PhD in the Department of Theology and Religion and specifically looking at modern British Druids and death ritual, which is a little bit out there. Um, I think the biggest issues in terms of reading, um, firstly, it's what I'm doing is effectively very interdisciplinary. So there's religious studies, there is ritual studies, there's death studies, there's pagan studies, there's archaeology, in fact, to some extent, for various reasons. Um, so I'm having to read across a lot of different disciplines that all have different conventions and different ways of expressing themselves. And uh, as I was saying earlier, I'm a very slow reader. Uh, I, I absorb information quite well, but it takes me a long time to read something. Okay, thanks Jennifer. And I said that we'd look at um, techniques for speed reading when you've got a lot of material to read. Um, Michael, um, over to you. Yeah. Um... So I'm reading Theology and Ministry at Cranmer Hall, part of St. John's, um, the one-year MA program. So uh, quite a lot to do in a single year, <laughs> but uh, working through that. Um, and so, I, and I would say a lot like Jennifer, I'm, I retain well. I know where to find what I need. Um, I just don't. I think I'm. I spend too much time in trying to make sure that I'm absorbing and then the ancillary material as well. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I think I feel that yeah. I am in that. Mm -hmm. So that's a good point that you raise. And we'll look at that between um, how you distinguish, um, you know, selective reading um, and then follow up reading. So um, what are your core texts? What's the extra stuff? Yeah. And then how do you maybe pick out as you're reading what the key bits are where you might dive a little bit deeper? Okay. Yeah, and I, yeah, I would just add the other thing that I struggle with is knowing when I've read enough, mm -hmm. because it feels like there's always one more piece that would just make it better. And yeah, so 
yeah that that's a good point when when is when is it enough yeah yeah uh, man uh you said you're doing a phd in modern languages in philosophy uh yeah philosophy uh, but um i guess my situation is also kind of like jennifer's because i'm doing a interdisciplinary project that's kind of philosophy and also something about biology actually so um i've been facing with the kind of the same challenges with jennifer and michael like uh how when should i stop or um how deep i should dive into a certain area um and also another thing i encounter when i'm reading is something like uh note taking mm -hmm. i could take a lot of notes and quotes from the things i've read but it usually take me a lot of time to like integrate them into at my actual thesis so yeah yeah, that's a good point. Note taking. We touch on that at the end of the session today, but I think that's probably worthy of a session in its own right. Um, and we'll talk a bit about purposeful reading. Um, so reading, um, knowing why, you know, why, what am I reading for? What question am I trying to answer so that you're very directed um, in your reading? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Daniel. Uh, yeah, like I said, I do French and Spanish. And I guess my difficulty with reading is, uh, like a lot of people, be the balance between speed and depth. Uh, quite often, if I do something quickly, I won't take enough in. So I think it's tactical how to deal with that. Yeah. Okay. And and helping you to recall, which is where note taking comes in a bit. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if Luke is participating or just observing. Luke, did you want to offer up any suggestions? Uh, yeah, so I study bioscience and um, I, my biggest difficulties are uh, to be able to prioritise reading is a big one and also being able to extract text but in a, a paraphrasing way. Yeah, okay, That's, we'll, we'll try and cover that as well then. Um, so it's going to be quite an interactive session. Um, oops, she says, going back a slide already. Uh, can you still see my screen? Yeah. Um, okay, so some of the common challenges and we've picked up on them there, but I've tried to summarize them on this screen. Um, somebody mentioned the complex vocabulary, you know, lots of technical terms that will be new to you, um, quite complex um, English um, that might be quite difficult to unpick, very long sentences and a particular um, style of academic writing, which isn't so easy to read until you kind of learn how to decipher and decode it. Um, uh, lots of people say that they struggle with a slow reading speed. Um, and some of that is about um, not reading word by word and not reading in a linear fashion. So you don't start at the beginning and read to the end every book or article that you're asked um, to look at. So we look at some techniques for how how you dot about in reading. Um, my daughter finds that quite, um, she says I'm a bit OCD and I want to start at the beginning and you know finish to the end. And she, she hasn't quite mastered the moving around. Um, the academic reading is very different from how you might read a novel for interest, for example. Um, and I think that perhaps leads on to the next thing, and we'll, we'll focus on this a bit, which is about awareness of different genre of texts. So we talk about academic genre. Um, so these are things like books, journals, different things that you are expected to read. Um, and they each have their own um, conventions um, and different, there will also be disciplinary differences. Um, so we'll touch on that a little bit. Once you begin to um, understand the structures of those different genres, it is much easier to navigate your way around them when you're reading. Um, the fourth thing on the bullet point here is about not understanding the context. And, and that's about taking a step back when you're reading something. So sometimes there's so much on the reading list and you just think I've got to get on with it. And you dive straight in without sort of pausing, stepping back and saying, OK, um, the title of this article is the author is what do I think this is going to be about? 
what position might the author be taking? What context are they operating in? When was it written? Um, and so we'll look at that a little bit as well. Um, and then I think that point that ties up also with note taking, not being able to identify the main points um, is a common um, difficulty that people have um, picking out the, the main things. And again, there are some strategies for that, which we will look at, um, looking at topic sentences at the beginning of paragraphs, not having to read the whole paragraph, um, some, some strategies like that. Um, we also talk about purposeful reading. Um, so um, reading when you know the purpose or the reason um, why you're reading. So yes, to answer an essay question. OK, so what is that essay question? And therefore, predicting, spending a bit of time before you start reading, predicting and asking questions. What am I looking for when I'm reading? being a bit more like a detective, I suppose, in the way that you approach the reading. Um, so not just um, taking for granted or assuming that what you're reading is correct, um, but actually interrogating um, the reading. Um, and to do that, you've got to have in the back of your mind a set of questions um, that you want answering. Um, and then a key thing is about being flexible. Um, so it's not about having a single way of reading, but having a range of strategies um, that you can draw on, um, like skimming and scanning, um, sometimes taking a surface approach, sometimes diving deep. Um, so again, we'll, we'll look at that. Um, and then the point that was raised about note taking, um, that sometimes you can read things and it's great if you have got that recall and you can remember where in the book and what page. Um, but if you don't, then you, you know, if you're then going to um, put in your bibliography um, where the idea was, you know, did you note that down? Have you got the pages? Have you actually got the, the references noted down correctly? Um, and have you captured in your notes those key points um, or ideas so that, you know, when you come back to them later, um, that you can still remember them. So recall drops off over time, um, inevitably. Um, so something you might remember, you know, an hour later, then a day later, you don't. And, you know, the reason we're recording this session is so that you can look at it again later and you might pick up different things second time round. Um, so those people who are, um, for whom English is a second language, um, a typical way of um, developing reading skills is to read things twice. So the first time you read them for gist, uh, just to get a general idea of what something is about. And the second time you read for the per more purposefully to answer specific questions or, or to find pieces of information. Um, so in some ways, if you're coming at reading as um, somebody who has English for a second, as a second language, it might be easier because you have some strategies in place. Um, and that might be quite different. That might be quite strange um, to people for whom English is their first language. Um, and I love this quotation. Uh, well, it's not a quotation, but the idea that came um, uh, from this book by um, Alexander um, uh, and others. It's an edited book um, for people who are teaching English for academic purposes. Um, and one of the points that's made um, is um, about lemons. And it's just a lovely sort of idea um, that if you're uh, teaching or writing um, or talking about lemons to students, what you want back when they're reading or listening um, is not just regurgitated lemons. You want the juice out of the lemons. So you're looking for your students to take that information squeeze it and get more out of it. Um, so this is about being very active uh, in how you read and also how you listen when you're in lectures. Are there any questions at that point before I move on? Feel free at any time to write in the chat if you want to. Okay, I'll go on to the next slide then. So the next slide is a question for you. And as we're a small group, we'll just stay um, together in one group. Um, but I wanted to write up on here. Oops, I've given you the answers. <laughs> right. 
pretend you didn't see that. If you're very good at, at, at reading things very, very quickly and very, very small, you, you'll have got the answers there. But I suspect, I suspect not. And um, what I want you to do is to write into the chat box the different things that you read. Um, and these are what we call genres, academic genres. So for starters, books or textbooks and journal articles. Um, if you could add to that list the various things, either online or in paper, hard copy format, um, that you have to read as part of your degree. And we'll just take a minute um, to do that. Yeah, so Jennifer's written on their conference papers, yeah, transcripts of interviews, interesting, yeah, so you're interviewing people. Literature reviews, that, that's a very important part of a, of a thesis, um, at the beginning of a thesis, yeah. Statistical reports from Luke, bibliographies, yeah, absolutely. Lecture folios, what are those, Michael? like a collection of like the Gifford lectures at okay. Aberdeen, I think it is like a or Edinburgh a collection of. So they're written up, they're lectures. That yeah, they're written up. Yep, yep. Okay. got you, yeah. Yeah, um, I find I have to read a lot of forum posts. I don't know about you, if you're in discussion forums um, on your programs, if you're doing online work. Um, Jennifer, you read fiction books, Luke, standard books from scientists, right? So yeah, recognition that there are different sorts of books that in, in fact, you could split books down into different types. Um, so you'll get um, edited works, won't you, which will be lots of different people's um, papers, if you like. Um, and then you'll get um, effectively textbooks, um, in the sciences, if you were a first year engineer, you might have a massive textbook that covers everything about electrical and electronic engineering or seems to. Um, Facebook posts on discussion groups. Yep, that's a good one. Okay. Individual chapters. Yep. So picking sections out. Um, and if you were going to do that, you could um say abstracts in a journal for example you don't read the whole journal article you just look at the abstract uh, we're going to look at one of those there's a, a genre about abstracts in themselves and how to write an abstract and how to read an abstract okay some great ideas there so on the next slide and i don't know how easy this is going to be to read um, so this is a mind map um, taken um, from one of my colleagues, borrowed from one of my colleagues um, on this um, course. And she's just drawn out those different um, texts that you might read. So yeah, Jennifer, you just picked one of them up there, book reviews. So we've got journals, articles, book reviews, reading lists, reference lists. Um, you might have research reports, lecture notes themselves, your notes when you go back and read them again, um, journal articles, and, um, and then within that, the abstracts, um, and perhaps the conclusions, because you look at the beginning and the end to help you work out what it's about. Um, the handouts that you, you might uh, be given, uh, we talked about forum posts, um, and rubrics the sort of rules on exams and assignments where you're reading what the questions are yeah um so in other words there are lots there's lots of reading it's not just books and journals um and we need techniques to read all of these different things okay so my next question for you then is to think about how you read and that, that might seem like a silly question, you know, everyone thinks, oh, I know how to read. Um, but, but actually, what are your techniques that you use and who is in control? So um, are you what we would call a dominant reader? So is it you that's in control or is it the book or the reading list that's in control of you and, and you're sort of trying to keep up? Um, and within that, um, do you ask questions? So this this is really about critical reading. 
Um, so thinking very actively about what you're reading um, and why um, and evaluating what you're reading. So not just taking it as given. And then note taking, we talked about it. note taking is really important um, because it helps you think. Um, it helps you recall, um, but it, it will make you engage um, in what you're reading in a way that quite often if you're just, you know, reading it, you might not um, take it all in if you're skimming it too much. Um, there's lots of um, writing about reading. Um, and one of the uh, famous authors is uh, John Swales. Um, he's done a lot of work on genre analysis. So looking at those different types of texts and decoding them for readers um, so that you understand how they are constructed and then that helps you to read them. Okay, so we'll We'll look now at some of those strategies which we've mentioned. Um, so we've talked about the difference between surface and deep reading um, and what you might call extensive strategies and intensive. So extensive being um, navigating around your reading list, um, perhaps finding sources. If you're doing a PhD, you have to find your own sources. So um, looking in other bibliographies, referencing, cross-referencing um, to, to work out even what you want to read when it's not presented for you. Um, so, uh, you know, post in um, postgraduate study, you're expected um, to find a lot of your, your own sources. They're not given to you. Um, and then that leads on to the next point, which is about quality. How therefore do you know what is a good quality source? Um, and one of the traps that people quite often fall into is, you know, Googling it, Googling it, and that's your kind of your list of sources. But you've got to evaluate, you know, um, what is a good source. Um, so I put that out to you as a question, really. Um, how do you determine, how do you judge what, what is a source that is credible? I look for peer review um, in looking at journal articles. Uh, the other is um, if it's been cited multiple in multiple other pieces I'm writing, um, that's another way. Yeah, brilliant. And we've got some comments in the chat to the same effect. Yeah. So citations and peer review. So how how credible um, is, is the journal? Um, do... Uh, and you can, we'll, we'll look at some examples in a minute. Um, you can actually look up the rules um, on how to submit an article to that journal and then see um, how difficult it is to get your, your work approved and how many different people review it before it gets published. Um, and then, yeah, looking at citations. Um, and also, yes, if, if, so if somebody else cites that work, do you find that person being quoted elsewhere? Um, is that a good source? Um, so it's important to look at the authority um, of the source. So yeah, thank you for that comment um, in the chat there, um, Jennifer and, uh, and to Minky, thank you. Um, then we'll look at um, skimming, um, this idea of looking for gist and general understanding um, and sort of speed reading in order to then determine which things you might go back to to look at in more detail. Um, scanning, which is when you're reading for specific information. So you've noted down perhaps um, key phrases or ideas um, and you're, you're looking for more information about those. And then I think we've touched on the other items um, already. So there's an example reading list here. I'm not sure if this will work. So let, tell me if you can see this, if it comes up. It's thinking about it. Can you still see that? Yeah, great. Um, so this is just a sample uh, reading list um, for a course on uh, Greek and Roman. So this is a bibliography. Um, and you can see that you've got the, um, the links so you can go and look at things straight away. 
Um, and there's a range of different things on here. So there are books, you know, which some of them are quite old, 1978. Um, other things are much more up to date. There's an article there from 2009. Um, but there's a lot on here. And of course, one of the great things about having all this stuff digitally um, is that you can use search tools um, to help you work out which thing on the list to look at. But it can be daunting, can't it? If you've got a reading list that's as long as that, and that's just one module, um, then you can feel um, overwhelmed. Oh, somebody said they've not got anything on their screen. Sorry, Luke. I'll just escape out of that. To imagine a reading list. Close that down. All right. I'll uh, reshare. Okay, so we've done the genres. Right. Um, let's look at this book. Just opening a link to an online book. Uh, it's not going to let me do it because there's no access to the library at the moment. Okay. okay sorry about that. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll look at selective reading. And I think um, these slides will be made available afterwards. So um, you'll be able to look at these links afterwards. That's probably the best way to do that. Um, I've put on there a link to an online book, um, which has got a really detailed set of contents. Um, and you could quite easily imagine that if you were given a, um, an exam question or assignment title, um, that you'd be able to quite quickly identify within that book, which is the chapter or the section that you want to read. So that makes life really easy. It's obviously much harder if the book's not available digitally, and especially at the moment, if you can't get to the library because they're not going to scan and send you the entire book. Um, so, um, so that can be a bit of a problem, but it's, yeah, it's really important to be able to narrow down your search uh, within a book to identify those, those key bits. So you're probably used to, I'm sure you're used to using contents page, the index, reading the introduction, um, looking at the chapter headings, looking at um, the diagrams, if there are illustrations, um, looking at tables. So actually you can get a lot of information from the visuals that there might be in, in a book rather than just reading the text. Um, and that's a very good way to help you navigate around the book. And I suppose so therefore what I'd say is never just start at the beginning and turn over page by page, um, but you know, navigate around, work out um, what the whole thing is about before you then decide which bits to go back to. Um, in the same way, journal articles um, have a very clear structure. Um, so you will have an abstract at the beginning. Um, there, there might be a literature review. Um, there'll be clear section headings. Um, and you can therefore read just the first sentence and the last sentence of each section to get an idea um, of what each bit is about. And again, looking at diagrams and looking at the conclusions. So you can navigate your way around these. You don't have to read, if, if it's a 10 page article, you don't necessarily have to read the whole article in depth. Um, you find the bits that are relevant. I've put an example, again, there's a link which you can look at afterwards, um, a link to an article, but you'll have journal articles from your own field um, that you can look at and see if it, if it maps onto this structure. Um, and then we'll probably cover in another session for those people who are more concerned about essays, you know, about what you'd expect to see in the structure of essays, um, which I'm sure you're all familiar with by now, introductions, arguments, counter arguments, conclusions. And obviously, um, clearly, um, in the way that you lay it out in each paragraph, having topic sentences. So being able to just read the first bit um, of each paragraph is really important. 
Um, and then using um, online tools to help you to search for keywords and phrases. Um, so if there's a particular thing um, that you want to look for, um, that you can see where it occurs in the document. And that's a really good way of navigating around online materials. Um, I don't know how legible this is, but again, it will be on the slides afterwards. Um, but this is just to show you how structured abstracts are um, and how much information you can get out of a journal abstract. Um, so as there was some research done by, I think it was by John Swales that looked at you know, hundreds of journal articles from different disciplines and identified that abstracts fall into a, a fairly common um, structure. So you always in the first sentence, what, what's defined here as the first move um, is, is the introduction that sets out um, what's being explored in this particular journal article. Um, so a bit, a bit of context setting the purpose um, of the article then something about the method, methodology or hypothesis um, that is being pursued. Um, then the results and then the conclusion. So basically in the abstract that comes at the front of the journal article, you get a potted uh, summary of the whole of the article. Um, so when you're first looking at your sources and deciding which are most useful, um, just reading the abstract and no more than that will give you a good idea of whether this is going to be a helpful source um, for the particular question that you're addressing. Um, his research goes into even more detail to say, you know, exactly what um, uh, in type of English is used. So is, is it present tense or is it past? Is it presented in third person and so on? You don't, you don't need to go into that, but just actually recognizing how formulaic I think um, these different genres are is quite helpful um, for you to then uh, be able to read them more quickly because you know what you're looking for. Um, and then um, that, I guess, leads us on to this idea of purpose and then what skills you need um, to be able to execute um, that. So um, exploiting book lists sort of at the top level. So these are your global strategies um, and library catalogs and e-directories. At, at that level, you're really skimming. You're very even hyper skimming. Um, so this is from Tony Corbalis, who's um, a lecturer at the University of London, who again, teaches English pre-sessional programs. Um, so thinking about your sort of library and search skills, um, at that very top level, you are really in this sort of hyper skimming mode. So you're definitely not trying to read everything. You're looking for keywords um, and you're navigating um, around uh, texts um, to decide what's most relevant um, to go back to. So this is about being able to distinguish between um, the stuff that you're interested in and the stuff that you're not going to bother looking at so that you can prioritize your reading. Because I think you just accept that you're not going to read everything. You couldn't possibly. I mean, you walk into the library and it overwhelms you, doesn't it, to see how much is there, and yet that's only an nth of, of what there could be. Um, and and you know, when you're getting into a PhD, you become the expert in that particular area, but you're sort of expected to read everything there is um, on that area in your literature review before you then add to the knowledge of the academy. Um, so. Um, You've got to be able to do this sort of top level um, skimming, what, what's relevant and, and what isn't. So once you've selected those <clears throat> relevant articles, it's important to then be able to scan within those and to record um, the bibliographic details so that you've got those references um, and you can then use those references to find other material. And that's a key way in um, research um, when uh, both undergraduate and postgraduate level to to help you find other sources. Always best to try and pin down the original as opposed to quote the person from somebody else's work. Um, always best to go to that original source. Um, and then we've got stage three, which is selecting the relevant parts of the text. So. Um, being able to identify uh, particular sections, um, 
things that are going to aid your argument or support your argument, looking for evidence that you can reference. And then being able to compare, so not reading one thing, putting it down, picking up the next thing, but actually thinking about what did I learn from that, keeping it in my head whilst I go on to the next thing. And then going back maybe and looking at the two side by side and going, well, so-and-so says that, what does this person say about the same thing? Um, so not separating, but actually looking at the range of ideas together so that you can develop your arguments and counter arguments um, and think about what your own position is. Um, so evaluate what, what your own position is. Um, I guess that leads on to the next thing, which is about finding that evidence. So, <clears throat> and, and linked into note taking, you know, where, where is the evidence that I want to go back to when I talk about that idea? Uh, where did that come from? Um, so which source, which page? crucial if you're doing a PhD um, that it's not enough to just say oh that was in um, you know I'll, I'll use you Michael your surname Simant so that was in Simant 2020 yeah which one which book what page what chapter um, so being really specific um, not just talking generally about an idea and I don't know this again, this is a question to you. Do you ever use annotated bibliographies? That was a new genre to me. Uh, some people nodding. Um, so an annotated bibliography, um, you might be asked to give this, which is where you put the source and then you evaluate, you give a sort of potted summary of what that source is about and then what the key points you've got out of it and what your opinion is um, so you might be asked for that and I think actually that's a really helpful approach in note taking um, so you put the full reference to that source um, in, including um, the, the uh, hyperlink and the date that you accessed it so you've got the full reference and then underneath that, you've got maybe a hundred words, or maybe less that says um, what that source is about. Um, and I can send you an example later, actually, um, of one um, that I've done that might be helpful. So what that source is about, um, what were the uh, key um, ideas um, or the, the methodology, um, the, the results, um, and then what's your sort of evaluation of that? And that's a really good um, practice to get into um, so that it's you really thinking actively about, you know, what's the relevance of this source? Um, and then you can come back to it later if you want to. So I think at that global level, getting the, the gist um, of that source and then the specific pages where you think there are key things that, um, uh, evidence that you might want to go back to what ideas you want to draw out. I'll just pause there in case anyone wants to ask a question. Okay, okay, sorry, just finish that, go back to that. Um, right, if you still got that on the screen. So yeah, just looking at the other things on there, um, we then go into the intensive reading. So you've done all of that sort of top down stuff before you then get to how you might read a novel in lots and lots of detail, um, where you are noting down um, specific things. And then the final stage, um, kind of broadens out again. Um, so this is more about extensive reading. Um, so this is showing that you've read um, across different ideas, that you've got enough breadth in your reading. Um, this will be important to those people who do um, PhDs, but important also in, in other disciplines. Thanks for the comment in the chat, man, yes. about putting your own arguments down, yeah. So it's about 
having your own opinions, but it's also about knowing, knowing the breadth of work in that particular field. Um, and I suppose the, the ultimate in that is the literature review where you're demonstrating um, that you have read um, what's been published on that subject before. Um, and certainly in a PhD, I would expect in a, um, in a viva, in an oral examination, um, that you'd be quizzed on that, you know, um, especially your external examiner, you know, make sure you've read everything that your external examiner has written on the subject, um, because they're bound to ask you. I say that because I was asked in my viva, there was one thing that I hadn't referenced from this particular examiner. Um, and I just uh, hadn't noted it down properly. And so I couldn't put it in the bibliography because it was an incomplete reference. And he picked it out in the viva and said, oh, what about blah, 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 didn't, you know? And I said, oh yeah, I, I have read that. <laughs> and I was able to tell him about it. So he knew I'd read about it, but they certainly will pick you up on it. Okay. Um, I'm not sure because we've only got 15 minutes left. We probably won't have time to actually do this in class as an exercise, but I, I recommend this to you. Um, if skimming is something that you want to practice. Um, so there's an article here, um, which you can click on, which is an open university article. And I've actually highlighted the relevant pieces. And it's literally for you to just read it and identify what are the key points that are being made in each paragraph. Um, so on this table here um, is a summary of, of the main points and then you've got to identify which paragraph that is in. Um, and it's really, it's to train you, it's to train you to read and to be quite disciplined in just reading the introduction, the first sentence of each paragraph and then the conclusions. And if you do that, you should be able to identify what is the missing topic. So there's one thing I've missed out in that list. Um, and then at the end, what is the extract about? And there's three options for the answer um, to that. Um, so is, it's about health issues, but um, is it about health issues in developing countries or is it about malnutrition or the third one, which I can't see because my screen's covering it up. So you've got three options to look at there, but I think it's a really good exercise to do. Maybe take 10 minutes um, to do that, but it's worth having a go um, at that. Um, and then we talk a little bit more just about critical reading. Um, and I see this as a bit of a continuum really. So at one side of that continuum if you like you've got surface reading and that's really taking things at face value treating things as facts and figures um, and assuming that you know the author is correct and i need to write all of this down and then i need to regurgitate it or retell it um, that that would be classed as surface reading um, so thinking in terms of the level um, in the in the thinking or cognitive domain that you're operating in as students at undergraduate and postgraduate level you're you're not operating at the level of knowledge or understanding that's expected you're also expected to apply and analyze and critically evaluate and synthesize so you're expected to be able to work at a much higher level um, and this is really about you know thinking being critical um, in your approach and some techniques for that um, just to, as I said, to pause when you start reading um, and think, what's the context in which that text was written? So what date? Um, who wrote it? Who did they write it for? Um, might there be something else at play in terms of the socio-cultural context in which that was written? Um, so, and in particular, um, is there a very clear stance from the author? Um, a position um, that they're taking or point that they're trying to make. And then you need to think about collecting evidence. So it goes back to this being a detective, really, um, that you're when you're reading, you're collecting evidence. Um, 
you're thinking about cross-referencing ideas and looking at those source different sources and looking at what that person says and what that person says um, and then you're weighing up you're evaluating um, that information and drawing your own conclusions um, and even introducing new ideas of your own and certainly obviously in a PhD that's what's expected that you're in, you're producing new information um, so it's not enough to just retell um, what's in the texts that you read you've got to put your own layer of interpretation um, onto it um, there's a link which you can follow here which goes into more detail on that um, which sets out a whole load of statements between surface and critical reading and invites you to, to look in more detail at that. So again, I suggest perhaps look at that later. Um, but I would like to look at this um, uh, as an exercise um, to get you to think about how people write and how styles of academic writing might indeed have changed over time and you might be looking at some sources which are older and done in a different way so there uh, there are two links here one is a text um, from this um, book called mythologies written in 1957 um, by a french philosopher and it's tied up with advertising and it's talking about this brand uh, which was big at the time which was for a soap powder, for a detergent. Um, and then the second link is, is my sort of notes on that text um, and ideas. Um, so I'll open this up. I don't know how easy that's actually might be better if I put the link. Hmm. Uh, if I stop that share and then I do a new share. Can you actually see this or is it too small? <clears throat> Again, I can send the link to this afterwards, um, but maybe just um, have, a, have a skim through this um, and see what you think, what you make of it. I'll just put a question in the chat box there for you um, to just read the first paragraph and comment on the style in which it is written and what it is about. Um, so if you want to add any comments to the chat. And then maybe add any questions you've got from reading it. Oops, sorry. 
Okay, so I'll give you a question for starters. Um, you might ask, who is the author? Yep. Any other ideas, questions or comments? Yeah, good question, Luke. Why was it written? Um, it's, and what is it about? Can you get that from the first paragraph? Yeah, yeah, it's about advertising. Um, so who's the target audience? Is it is it advertisers or detergent makers? There's a word here. One could then usefully contrast the psychoanalysis of purifying fluids. So he's comparing chlorinated products with soap powders and detergents. It's written in a very particular language, isn't it? It's perhaps not how we would speak today. So um, Barthes is a French philosopher. Um, and he's, he's writing about advertising. You know, TV advertising was just starting then in the 1950s. So it's about how advertising persuades us what's good or bad. What about the language that he uses? It's very emotive I think isn't it he talks about evil and cure um, it's got a particular got a particular style to it so I suggest that that's again something that you might um, look at in more detail afterwards um, I'll just close that and then if I reshare um, have I got the text yeah no, that's different. Yeah, the other link on here um, is my notes. So you can look at that in more detail. Um, but it's quite, it's a short extract. Again, 10 minutes. Um, it's a good way of making you think about how you'd approach something that isn't necessarily from your subject area um, and how you would approach it in a critical way um, to ask the right questions. Okay, so then finally, uh, we come around to note taking. So we've already said that um, note taking is really important because it engages you um, actively in reading. Um, and that one of the things you should be looking for is noting down the questions, the questions that you have, your predictions of what the text might be about, um, and then the key um, pieces of information. Um, that you want to record. And I say units of information because it's not just keywords. It's not sufficient to just highlight um, words here and there as are their important words, but actually capturing ideas. Um, so units of information and showing causality or links between those ideas. And doing it in your own words. So not just a... Um, not just a highlighter pen. So having said that, I have highlighted this here. So what I've done here is an extract um, um, with this idea of how you capture units of information. So there's a sample of text um, and the main points are highlighted. And then these are shown as the students notes underneath. It's a very personal way of taking notes. It's using um, shorthand um, images. This is the world, so that's global. And this is about people. 
So this person has, um, has turned this amount of text into this in terms of notes. Um, so two and a half billion people around the world are connected to each other through the internet. So you can see here, they've put two and a half billion connected worldwide web. Um, at any point in time, more than 30% of the world's population can go online. Um, and he summarized that here, 30% of world people go online. I think you might struggle to understand that without it being translated for you because it is somebody else's notes. Um, and then the final point here that uh, the young generation alone is spending over eight hours a day online. So they've noted down eight hours a day, but they haven't noted down anything about this being young people specifically. Um, so there's a there's a point that's been missed there in the notes, uh, which is about the um, age profile of people who look at the Internet. OK, that I think would deserve a session in its own right to maybe look in more detail at note taking in lectures and in reading. Um, but I just wanted to put that idea out there to you um, as a method that you might look um, to, to use in your note taking, uh, but also the annotated bibliography. Um, and I will send you that um, link afterwards. Um, OK, uh, that pretty much draws us to the end of the session. Um, and these are some of the things that we've touched on. And there's some exercises for you to follow up with. Um, but are there um, questions or comments that you'd like to make? No, no comments in the chat. I'll be very happy to answer any questions you've got afterwards. Um, if you want to email me, I'll put my email in the chat. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming. And um, thank you, Luke, for um, suggesting this as a topic. I hope it's been helpful. Um, the key thing is obviously to practice um, some of these techniques for yourselves, um, but good luck.